is Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Simperman, and we're here tonight to talk to you about getting a better brain, enhancing your brain health. So as always, the information presented in this program is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, illness, or health condition. The statements presented in this program have not been evaluated by the FDA. And as always, you should consult with a licensed healthcare professional before beginning any type of treatment. Well, if you only had a brain, we're hoping that the information presented here this evening will make sure that you have a healthy brain. So is your brain slowing down? Have you asked yourself this question? 35.6 million people over the age of 60 years old are living with dementia. That's a lot of people. And by 2050, this will reach 115.4 million individuals. Now, and this isn't including people with just brain fog, cloudy thoughts, and, and just a little bit of simple memory loss. Now, the National Institute on Aging has some statistics here, and they're telling us that 5.3 million people over the age of 65 exhibit symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. 200,000 under the age of 65 exhibit symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, Alzheimer's damage uh, involves amyloid placking in the brain, and they found through studies that this actually starts 10 years prior to the onset of symptoms, 10 years or longer before the symptoms start to manifest themselves. So early signs of this would be mild cognitive impairment, impaired reasoning, diminished sense of smell. So these are all early warning signs that you may be developing this type of condition. So before we get into how to get our brains healthier, I think it's important to know some anatomy. And this way will help you to understand a little bit about healing your brain and uh, preventing neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's. So we have two types of brain cells that we're gonna talk about that are the most important brain cells. And one are neurons, which most people have heard about. And neurons are usually the cells that result in the most damage and neurodegeneration. They release hormone-like chemicals called neurotransmitters, which most people have heard about. We're going to talk more about neurotransmitters. And they are transported via an electrical impulses between nerve cells. And so that's why it's important that we have good fats and oils around those nerve cells and the, and the um, connections because that helps us with conduction just like an electrical wire. So when these nerve cells and neurons are damaged, it does take a while for them to reheal, and there is studies that have shown that they can be repaired. Now the glial cells, which are basically the glue that holds all this together and is a big network, like um, a fishing net of glue that keeps the neurons safe and keeps the blood safe. This controls the barrier around your brain, the blood-brain barrier, which can become inflamed and cause uh, many types of degeneration to the brain. It also acts like an immune function for the brain and keeps things out of the brain that do not belong there. And it stops brain plaques and helps repair scarring. And there's 10 to 50 times more neurons than there are, um, there are more glial cells than there are more neurons. So this is what your neuron looks like. It has these tiny little things called dendrites on the end and that's where uh, we have some uh, neurotransmitters released and then we have the impulse station which is along that uh, myelin sheath which people have heard about most likely in MS as far as diseases go. But that's where degeneration a lot of times takes place is in that sheath and that electrical component of the neuron. And this is what our glial cell looks like, our glue cell. 
So these are the cells that we have lots and lots of compared to the neurons. So what about the neurotransmitters? You've heard of them, so what do they do? And well, they're the messengers of your nervous system and they're involved in so many functions here, which you can see we have many of them listed, heart rate, gastrointestinal function, um, very important in mood and mood swings, as well as uh, in sleep disturbances and fatigue and depression and anxiety. Uh, I know you're familiar most people are, you know, with depression and anxiety and, and fatigue and sleep disturbances that neurotransmitters can be involved in these things, uh, but also cravings and uh, weight loss, uh, weight management, headaches, and libido. So all these things, your neurotransmitters are very important to the proper functioning of your nervous system because as Dr. Gallagher mentioned earlier, that's how the the nervous system communicates among itself with those neurotransmitters. And what are they? Well, we know that there's glutamate, and this is involved with memory and movement. GABA is involved uh, with sleep and anxiety. Serotonin is a big one for mood, anxiety, and body temperature regulation. And dopamine is involved with motivation, drive, your attention and enjoyment. Endorphins is the feel good or decrease pain neurotransmitter. So here again is a picture of a nerve cell with the neurotransmitters crossing from one nerve cell to another through that gap. And you'll see that little gap in the little uh, yellow orange dots that are bringing the uh, neurotransmitters, the little heart brain hormones to the next nerve cell. And then it conducts through that sheath which protects and conducts that um, nerve information over to the next cell. So neurotransmitter disruptors, we have to look at this because Stress is one of the biggest things that disrupts many functions in our body, including the neurotransmitters. We also have diet and nutrition, which is really important. We have toxins, blood sugar, infection, and autoimmune, autoimmune diseases and allergies. And many of these things can also create a situation in our bodies which uh, can turn on bad genes. So. These are things that we have to keep in mind, and these are all things that we do have some degree of control over, especially the stress, diet, nutrition, and we're going to talk about how we can get toxins out of our uh, system uh, as we progress in this program. So let's talk about some of the neurodegenerative diseases and mostly the ones that we know about, most people know about, and Parkinson's is one of the biggest ones. And I want to present here the early signs of Parkinson's, things we need to look for, um, you know, pre-Parkinson's. Um, I have a lot of patients with Parkinson's-like uh, diagnoses where they haven't fully um, reached the full diagnosis and hopefully never will. So one of the big things is tremors, and most people will notice that. A lot of people will have tremors. Um, but what, some of the things that you might not know about would be like loss of smell and dizziness and your voice being uh, low, sleeping difficulties, constipation. So some of these things you're, you're wondering, how is that related to Parkinson's disease? But these are some of the things that the studies have shown will let us know that a person might be heading towards that disease. And Alzheimer's some early warning signs that we need to be aware of would be memory loss, difficulty problem solving, you know, just difficulty concentrating, especially difficulty with tasks that we're really familiar with, uh, confusion, poor judgment, and being withdrawn from social or work activities as well as mood changes. And dementia, which um, most of the time people get put in, dementia patients get put into the Alzheimer's category, but they're really two different things. Short-term memory loss that interferes with daily life. 
impaired immune, impaired communication and language, impaired reasoning, and impaired vision. So it's not as severe as some of those Alzheimer's um, symptoms and, you know, not the same as Parkinson's at all. So remember, dementia has short-term memory loss, okay, which is, a, you know, one of the big things, um, and a person really is struggling to reason. And I think that those are the main, main, main characteristics of a dementia patient. So what causes this uh, decline of brain function? Well, inflammation and damage to the blood-brain barrier is, is really a key component here. And how does that occur? Well, the, you know, it can start in your gut. We've talked before about the gut-brain connection and leaky gut and dysbiosis. And these are things that can create inflammation in the body, um, and this can ultimately affect the blood-brain barrier as well. Uh, we know that certain lifestyle habits that we may have can turn on bad genes, which can also affect this. And this is something that just doesn't happen overnight. So the you have to realize that this is a process that begins many years, up to 30 years before you may start showing symptoms. So you have to really think about this, you know, earlier on in your in your life, because the habits and things that you do then are going to result in the condition that you end up in when you're older. So you have to keep that in mind. It's very important. So what can cause brain inflammation? Of course, we all know that if we've had a head trauma, um, that would definitely be one of the big reasons why people would have, um, you know, brain inflammation. If you have poor circulation, which you may not know, um, so that's something that could go undetected. Most people know if they have anemia or autoimmune disease, some people wouldn't know if they have systemic inflammation because you're not always sure. Uh, leaky gut, which we talked about not only in today's program, but in many programs prior to this. In fact, we have a leaky gut, leaky brain program if you want to know more about that. And I think the most important thing people don't realize about gluten is it's not just for people to um, take out of their diet because they have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune type condition. But because gluten will cause inflammation of the brain and make it, um, it's similar to opioids in the brain and it does cause placking. So that's a really good reason to stay away from gluten uh, and use other types of grains that don't have lots of gluten in them. We know blood sugar or type 3 diabetes, as I like to call it, or diabetes of the brain causes an amazing amount of inflammation, especially if we have a huge amount of insulin. Uh, our environment, pollutants, chemicals, and of course, those nasty bugs that can cross into the brain and cause all kinds of havoc. So what would be some symptoms of brain inflammation? Well, it could be brain fog, uh, just difficulty focusing, you know, your thoughts seem to be jumbled up. Uh, you just seem to be slow uh, recalling things and, and just your mental acuity is, is diminishing and you just have that tired brain feeling. So all these things can, you know, clue you in that maybe you do have some inflammation going on in the, in and around the brain and that your blood, uh, blood brain barrier may be, uh, not functioning as well as it could be. So what breaks down this barrier around your brain? You remember we talked about it's a nice fatty membrane. It has, you know, those glial cells and, you know, doesn't allow a lot of things to get in. It's a protective mechanism. But if you have a lot of chronic stress, that could make holes in that membrane. Uh, insulin surges can break it down. Of course, alcohol, sugar, you know, Roundup or glyphosate, you know, when they talk about the non-GMOs, which are 
foods that have the glyphosate already in the genetic material of the food, exposure to toxins and heavy metals and things of that sort, uh, your leaky gut can break down that barrier, inflammation of the body. If you don't have a lot of antioxidant reserves, if your liver doesn't work real well, and you don't have a, a really good antioxidant reserve, you have increased homocysteine levels, which you can me measure on your lab tests, on your regular blood tests. If you have a lot of exposure to electromagnetic force, which is like your Wi-Fi and your cell phone and things of that sort, we know that that breaks down the blood-brain barrier. And of course, we talked a little bit about infections, things like Lyme disease doesn't even need to have, to have a blood-brain barrier broken down. It can cross right over, but other infections can get into the brain, viruses, bacteria and different things like that can affect uh, your neurological status. So how would you go about improving this uh, brain health? Well, detoxification and drainage, this would involve removing the toxins, whether they be infections, heavy metals, uh, things like that. So you want to be able to detox them from your brain and then drain them and remove them out of your system. Uh, improving your immune health, especially in the gut area, fixing that leaky gut. We talked about how important the gut-brain connection is. So this is a big part of your immune system's health is in your gut. So making sure that you have good healthy gut and a good healthy microbiome there is very important. And also um, doing things to improve your overall health and strengthening your immune system um, and just making sure that your diet is clean and that you're exercising and that you're using uh, supplements that are going to support optimum brain health and making sure that you're getting, getting enough rest, enough sleep. Sleep is so vital to healing and repairing and regenerating your body. Uh, most people don't get enough sleep. So this is very important that you sleep at least seven to eight hours a day. So what is this detox and drainage? So first of all, I want to mention that doing any type of detox, and I don't mean a colon cleanse, which I find very invasive to the colon because you're going to make yourself dehydrated, get rid of all your good nutrients and bacteria, but like getting back to detoxing should be supervised. Detox is really a big part of what your body should do naturally. However, most people do not have a gallbladder or liver or lymphatic system or spleen that can actually do this work because it has been worn down over time, exposed, and it's not at 100% optimum. So we have to do this ourselves and then it should be supervised by a natural healthcare professional in order to be sure that you're doing it properly and you're getting your body through all the phases of detox, not just part of it. So I like to use very gentle detoxes. I don't want people to have that Herx or detox reaction if we can help it, although some do no matter what we try. And I like this homeopathic detox kit, which goes through all the different parts of the brain and the connective tissue, the spinal cord, the nerves, and then also the detox organs like the liver, kidney, and lymphatics. And it's a very slow process. It takes about six weeks, maybe even eight weeks of using these um, small dosage of homeopathic liquids, which makes it very easy to do. And most people don't even know they're going through this process. Uh, a little bit of a Different, more focused detox would be the brain phase detox with alpha lipoic acid, which really helps to um, remove toxins from the brain and also um, make sure that we have less neural inflammation. The alpha lipoic acid is a big component of that, along with botanicals and some nutritional support. So we all, we mentioned earlier that improving your immune system's health is very important in fixing that gut-brain connection. So if we find that we have some gut issues that are affecting us, we need to address them to optimize our brain function. And, you know, getting rid of those 
gut pathogens, restoring balance to the microbiome is very important. Uh, you know, there's a uh, repopulating the uh, GI tract with good bacteria is, is also vital. Uh, using digestive enzymes to make sure that we're breaking down and digesting our food for optimum absorption and gastrointestinal health is also important. Um, intermittent fasting can be very beneficial in healing the gut. Uh, and if you are diagnosed with one of these neurodegenerative conditions, you may even want to consider a ketogenic diet because they have been found to be very helpful uh, for people with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and, and other types of cognitive conditions. So there are a lot of foods that are very beneficial to your brain health. Uh, many of them contain good fats and oils, which we know are very important for a healthy blood-brain barrier and in general, good for cell membrane health. You can see those on here, uh, coconuts, coconut oil, olives, olive oil, avocados, uh, walnuts, almonds, salmon, uh, sunflower seeds. Also, there's been recent studies that have shown that olive oil, a couple tablespoons a day on a continuous basis can help to dissolve those amyloid plaques that form in the brain. So, you know, there's a lot of things in here. I'm sure there are things in here that you can find that, that you like to eat and try to incorporate them into your diet to uh, help maintain a healthy diet and good brain health and good membrane, cell membrane health, not only blood brain barrier, but all the cell membranes in your body will benefit from the good fats and oils that you can get from some of these foods. So what do we do about nutrition and herbal support for the brain? There's just so many things that are, are known to help the brain. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. We want to focus on some of the, the herbs that will cross the blood brain barrier. Things like St. John's wort will help to cross the brain barrier, ashwagandha, valerian will cross that. Um, bacopa, bacopa is something that is fantastic for the brain. It not only crosses the blood brain barrier, but enhances cognitive memory and concentration. And we can get that in straight liquid of bacopa, which is fantastic. Uh, the hemp oil, the hemp oil complex, which has some broccoli sprouts, which we know is brain protective, as, a, as well as allowing it, it brings it across the blood-brain barrier. So when you take hemp or CBD, does, it, does the brand you're using cross that blood-brain barrier and make the effect of the endocannabinoid system, which is something that is what we have receptors for with that CBD. But we know our hemp oil complex that we use from MediHerb and Standard Process does that. I take that every day and it has the broccoli extract in it to cross that blood brain barrier. OPC Synergy is something I take every day. It has the um, OPC, which is a really good antioxidant, as well as green tea. And that will be no, that crosses the blood brain barrier also and makes the, you have better, sharper focus. And I really like that. We already talked about the brain phase detox with alpha lipoic acid. What about turmeric? Turmeric Forte, another great product that will help with the curcumin in there to cross into the brain and reduce inflammation. Boswellia, which is frankincense, ginger, and turmeric complex also crosses over. The omegas will also reduce brain inflammation. So these are some of the really wonderful things we have available. Neurosyn for cognitive work, for nervousness, or tired brain, we can use Neviton. Uh, saffron St. John's wort, which has skull cap and sassandra. Rhodiola and sassandra really, really help with brain calming as well as calcium and magnesium. So we have a lot of things to repair the brain like Vista 1 and Vista 2, which will help with that blood-brain barrier. Um, so there are things that we can do to 
really help and support a healthy brain. And also it's very important to think about your lifestyle. We talked earlier about some of these uh, neurodegenerative changes can start 10 or more years before the symptoms begin. So um, you have to consider this and realize that the habits that you form now are going to affect you later in life. So exercising is vitally important, three hours minimum a week. We should practice some type of meditation or calming uh, process that we spend 10 minutes a day at minimum silent time, quiet time, prayer, reflection, whatever you want to call it. Um, sleep, seven to eight hours, uninterrupted sleep daily. So important for healing, repair, and regeneration of our bodies. And there's a, just like you exercise your body, you can exercise your brain. There are lots of ways to do this, crossword puzzles, word searches, um, Sudoku puzzles. Uh, there's all sorts of apps for your phone with uh, brain games and memory exercises. So find something that you can amuse yourself or entertain yourself with and still uh, exercise your brain daily. Okay, so we want to thank you for attending our webinar this evening. And of course, we always have special offers as a thank you to every one of you. So you could um, request uh, the Best Brain Foods List and the Healthy Brain Lifestyle Plan with some recipes from um, our office when you come in for an appointment. And then um, you could also, if you are, really want to take it to the next step, and get some brain support, you could uh, purchase some of the products we talked about. And we'll have a list at the office and the Healthy Brain Supplement Supports are available until August 10th at 10% off. So we hope you take advantage of some of that and we thank you for joining us again. Have a great evening.